Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Our broadcast today is brought to you by Nature Box, delicious snacks without all the junk, and they're shipped right to your front door. In fact, if you've never tried them, you can get a sample box shipped right to you on them. Just log on to this website and check it out, naturebox.com slash thinkingatheist, naturebox.com slash thinkingatheist. I've got two shows for you this week, of course, tonight's broadcast, and then Thursday is a podcast called Letter to the Editor. It's kind of a chronicle of a recent exchange I had in my hometown newspaper. I said something rather secular, and the fallout, I thought, bore mention on the radio. In fact, I thought it'd be kind of entertaining for you. So another show in two days. Hope you enjoy that. FYI, they just released confirmation that the Reason Rally in 2016 has a date. Yeah, they're going to do the Reason Rally again. You remember the huge event on the National Mall in 2012? Reason Rally's coming back. They're going to do another one on the Lincoln Memorial Grounds June the 4th of next year. And I think they're still nailing down the speaker list and all of the specifics, but bookmark this website so when those details come in, you can kind of find out. I believe so far they've got James Randi and Dr. Eugenie Scott, Cara Santa Maria, and several others on the roster. That's all in flux, but uh, you can go to reasonrally.org and sort of periodically check in as that event comes together. It was a big deal for me in 2012. I made a video about it myself. I'm wandering around the crowd with a video camera chronicling this amazing day. 30,000 people on the National Mall to celebrate reason. Didn't get a lot of press. <laughs> we certainly didn't get a lot of good press, but it was an amazing day. And I'm excited to see it happen again. So ReasonRally.org, bookmark that sucker. We'll keep an eye on it here in the months ahead as we look forward to June 4th, 2016. Before I get into our conversation with Greta Bosper, an atheist minister, and yes, we're going to ask about that, I want to say thanks out to a Nature Box for transporting me back to my childhood. They have animal cookies, whole wheat animal cookies in vanilla and chocolate. They taste great, and they just make you happy. They're animal cookies. Nature Box has long been a supporter of my show. I so appreciate them. If you watch my social media pages, you see many of our listeners posting their own Nature Box deliveries as they arrive. They'll just take a picture and tag me and say, we love this stuff. Over a hundred delicious snack options that are healthier for you and delivered right to your door. Peanut butter nom noms, the cashew power clusters. I've been enjoying the cranberry medley and the sriracha cashew crunch. Loads of flavor without all the junk and new snacks added every month so it never gets boring. And of course, the smart snack guarantee. If you don't like something, it's no problem. They just replace it in your next month's box. If you've never tried Nature Box, right now your first box of Nature Box snacks is on them, but you want to act fast. Go to naturebox.com slash Thinking Atheist. Unlock the taste. Unlock the possibilities. Naturebox.com slash Thinking Atheist. Greta Vosper is a minister in the United Church of Canada. She is also an atheist. She's an author. Her books include With or Without God, Why the Way We Live is More Important Than What We Believe, and Amen. What Prayer Can Mean in a World Beyond Belief. Greta is the founder of the Canadian Centre for Progressive Christianity. There was a May article in the Vancouver Sun that said this, A committee of the United Church of Canada has unanimously voted for a review of the effectiveness of Reverend Greta Vosper. 
the Toronto clergy person and author who proudly promotes herself as an atheist and publicly denounces all forms of religion. Religion News posted an article dated the 6th of August that said, Vosper, known as the atheist minister, is back in the news now that a church court will soon begin a review process to determine if she should be removed from the pulpit. I found this whole story intriguing. Uh, the idea of an atheist who wants to be a minister, quote-unquote minister, and the idea of trying to frame all of these secular ideas and humanist ideas inside church walls. What's that about? Well, we decided to go right to the source. My special guest tonight is Reverend Greta Vosper. Greta, thanks so much for being here. It's a pleasure, Seth. Thanks for asking me. So you've got a website, gretavosper.ca, and it says this at the very top. Let's start a conversation about just and compassionate living. I believe people can support each other with love and wisdom in a church with or without the God called God. So let's start there. If God isn't God with a capital G, what are we talking about? Well, there are lots of different understandings of what God can be, and that's part of the work that I do is trying to point that out, particularly to people who are leading within the liberal mainline Protestant tradition, which has allowed and encouraged through its seminary education, the exploration of the concept of God rather than the being of God, and has allowed clergy to develop very metaphorical, if we could use that word, understandings of that concept, but continue to retain the word God to identify it. So, someone who believes that God is about living with justice and compassion, about creating loving relationships, that God is a verb, that God is a concept that has evolved over time, and that we engage in trying to create God or strengthen God in the world by living with humanistic, humanitarian values. Calling that God, I found that to be misleading and unhelpful. And so I stopped using the word God to describe my concept of what I thought God was, because it didn't match the 99.99% of human understanding of God, which is of a supernatural interventionist being. Is it not confusing to take all of these other things and then frame them inside the God category? Can we find a better word, a better term, some better definitions for what we're trying to express? Within the liberal mainline Protestant tradition, the word God is used very often to describe things that are not supernatural, but natural, that do not have a defined being, but exist in a category of um, ill-defined concepts. Well, like and, what? I mean, help me out. We're speaking in generalities, but I mean, is yeah. it something that produces for me a feeling of awe and wonder, and therefore I, I say it is God? Yeah, well, that would be one. Lots of people would describe God as that sense of awe. Carter Hayward, uh, many years ago in a book, described God as the lurch in her stomach when she experienced or witnessed injustice. God is a feeling that moves us toward making good choices. But there is no, I mean, amongst my colleagues, many of them would eschew an understanding of God that had any agency. You know, I worry a little bit that many in the audience are starting to go glassy-eyed because what they hear, this may not be what is being communicated, but what they hear is, well, God is whatever you want it to be. Is this us making God in our own image to a degree? I think that we have been doing that since religion first came into being and started to articulate anything about divine uh, source of life, divine arbiter of justice, uh, any of that has always been in our own image. Uh, I think that the desire and the pretense of having that something that pre-existed us serves certain purposes, but I don't think that it's particularly helpful at this point in time. Religion over the millennia has served to help keep us safe by identifying groups that we belong to that will care for and protect us, and we've created habits that help us identify who those groups are. But we can't divide the human community like that anymore and try to find our way toward a sustainable future. 
So what is it that we're doing? And do I think that it's valuable to take that forward? I think it's got value. So I'm willing to lose all the language, the scripture, the definitions of God and move beyond them into carrying forward those humanitarian values that I think are important. You want to take the church out of church, essentially. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and and even more so. I mean, recently in the congregation that I serve, we we talk about being barrier-free, and theological language is a barrier. So we've removed that. And now we recognize that Sunday morning stand-up, sit-down, pass the plate, uh, styles of being together, that's a barrier. So we want to shift that. You know, like how do we transmit the distilled values that we feel whether they have their roots in religion or elsewhere, that we have determined by bringing our own ethical perspective to our religious documents and our religious heritage. This sounds suspiciously like Unitarian, uh, the the Unitarians uh, yeah, to me. It's interesting. Some of the Unitarians are pretty annoyed that I'm getting such media attention for something that they've done all along. But the interactions that we have had as a community with Unitarian communities has indicated that there's a supernatural element that is still held within the communities that we've been in dialogue with. Well, and, many of them have such a, a large tent, yeah. they invite all manner of philosophy, theology, just everybody is welcome. And mm-hmm. it makes it difficult to pin down what is true and what is not, which brings me, to, I think, to my larger point. Is it important to say, well, this is falsifiable? Like, we know that this is false, therefore we reject it. We know that this is not supported by science, history, and the evidence, therefore we reject it. And if you look at, I mean, Protestant Christianity, which is a big part of the Methodist Church, we were talking about the life and teachings of John Wesley, blah, blah, blah. I mean, if you start to deconstruct and refute the Bible, why are you then still a Methodist well, the work that I was, the work that I do now is because I was tired of deconstructing. And every time I preached a sermon, I went to the lectionary passages, the scriptures that were set out for that week, and I would do what I was taught to do in theological college. I was taught to contextualize them. Who wrote them? When did they write them? Why did they write them? Who were they writing them for? What was it they were trying to transmit? And so I spend fifteen or twenty minutes explaining all that to the congregation, and then I pick some, you know tiny little point or some thing that was identified in the scripture passage, and I'd make some kind of a moral uh, story uh, picture out of that, and that would be the end of the sermon. But mostly I was saying, we can't, there's nothing in this story that arose out of this context that applies to our current context. And so I'm going to create something that I think is meaningful in our context using it as perhaps a foundation to jump off of, but not finding within it any moral truths. And often, I mean, there are some stories in the Bible that have some very positive moral implications, but there are a lot of them that have horrific moral implications. And we have, over the course of the last two millennia and longer, we have brought our own ethical perspective to those. And we've decided, okay, man, we're not going to, we're not going to keep that one, but this one, you know, we'll keep this one, you know? So at the end, when we had, really almost completely transitioned the congregation to a theologically barrier-free congregation. Some of the people who ultimately left argued that they just wanted to hear me, you know, using the biblical passages and the stories of Jesus to help us live in our complex 21st century context. But when I would say, well, what stories? Well, they could come down to maybe two, like the Good Samaritan and the Parable of the Vineyard or something. Like they come up with two stories. Well, you want me to keep doing those two stories every week for 52 weeks of the year? No, there's not enough there. And we have no reason to have to ground our ethical decisions in the Bible. We have permission to find other ground for our moral choices. It just sounds like the method in your Methodist <laughs> is not exactly what I've seen in most Methodist churches. I worry that we're talking about relativism, where everybody can sort of decide for themselves what is true. Well, and, and I don't a- think the facts care how we feel about them, which is probably the one concern I would bring to the table. Now, maybe I've misunderstood you. I don't know. No, I don't think you have at all. And, and re- But relativism is a very, very scary place to live. And that's why I say, you know, like once we take that, the the denominations that have been offering a very liberal approach to social mores, once we take that out of the 
equation and you have a relativistic libertarianism ruling the space, then that creates a very ugly society. So quite in contrast with that, I think that we need to have places that have conversations that pull individuals into the conversation about what values do we want to live by in community. And, you know, uh, a laissez-faire economics puts a very relativistic attitude into moral decision-making. And I want to make sure that I haven't been unclear. I, I do support making choices relative, moral or otherwise, relative to the situations that you are in. I'm not an absolutist. I don't believe mm-hmm. in the objective moral standard, the objective logical standard, those types of things. I'm not sure that I subscribe to any of that. I understand we are living in a society where things are situational and we have to make moral judgments. We have to make ethical judgments based on the context in which we are operating. But when it comes to the evidence, when it comes to what is factual, what is not factual, what has been proven, what is disproven, I have a fear that people will say, well, it's true for you. It doesn't have to be true for me, which gives people a huge amount of latitude to act in unreasonable ways. No? I think that it does. And that's how I've ended up in trouble with the United Church of Canada, because in January, when my denomination posted a prayer on its website in response to the Charlie Hebdo attacks in France, I wrote an open letter to our moderator saying, as long as you continue to use that language, as long as we continue to say that God is calling us to live this way, we're giving religion and that word God as a tool to groups that would also use that language to ground their own moral choices. So even if they are horrific choices that we would not uh, support. So I think that we need to start dismantling and challenging, uh, dismantling if they are our own and challenging if they are others, uh, arguments for any kind of supernatural moral authority. So we will take, as we do so, we will challenge the tools that are in someone else's hands, and we will require that the conversations around what is right and what is wrong that take place within human community have their own authority, and that no one gets to trump that by saying, yeah, but my God says this right? Or I was meditating and I was told to do that. Your interpretation of whatever your experience, notwithstanding, you don't get to trump the decisions that have been made by the human community based on something that cannot be proven. Talking here with Reverend Greta Vosper. She is uh, Reverend, do I call you Minister, Pastor, West Hill United Church in suburban Toronto? What title do you prefer? I go by Greta. (laughs) The United (laughs) Church calls us ministers. Okay. Um, But I, you know, I recognize that lots of people identify me in various ways. You have an entire group of people who do church the way people do church, which provides community, it provides safety, it provides affirmation, and probably, possibly, most of all, provides structure. And you use words like dismantle. Has the congregation not just freaked out? No, actually. The, I mean, they. I freaked out when I, you know, I, I wasn't ready for a Sunday morning one week way back in 2001. And so when I got up to preach, and I don't keep notes, I don't write my sermons out, so I couldn't just pull a sermon out of a drawer. So I got up to preach, and I completely deconstructed God. I'd been upset by the claim that God had taken care of a family when a colleague of mine's child had been killed in a hurricane. And I hated the use of language like that. And so I just deconstructed God. So it was the problem of evil that sort of set you on your path then? Yeah, a bit of that. And the there, but for the grace of God, go I, uh, which suggests, you know, like, God damned you, but I'm just fine. (laughs) <laughs> um, like all of that stuff. I mean, so I so I deconstructed God, and at the end of the at the end of the sermon, or at the end of the service, I realized, you know, I had crossed, I had clearly crossed a line uh, in the relationship that I had agreed to be in with my congregation. So I asked to meet with the board. Uh, the board and I sat down. I was willing to. Uh, I knew that we needed to reconsider my relationship with the congregation, and they 
they the board said, so, okay, where do you want us to go? Like, what's this going to look like? And I had no answer for that. But they said, you know, we'd like to do this with you. And so as a board, they committed to leading the congregation through this transformational journey. It was vibrant and alive. We did a lot of work. In 2004, I founded the Canadian Centre for Progressive Christianity with uh, some other people from the congregation and others from beyond it. Uh, In 2008, I published my first book. And after, when I published that book, um, subsequent to that, we had been in a long conversation about the Lord's Prayer. Um, Who's we? You and the uh, the board or you and the congregation? The congregation. uh, Parents of the children had asked us to stop having the children lead the Lord's Prayer in the service back in 2004. 2005, we rewrote a, a, a different prayer so that the kids wouldn't be saying that. And we slowly, we moved the Lord's Prayer because there was a lot of anxiety around taking it out of the service. So we moved it. But three years later, there were more people in the congregation that were disturbed by it remaining as the sole thing that still looked and smelled and wagged its tail like a theistic piece of liturgy. So uh, after a number of liturgical calisthenic moves trying to accommodate both sides, I finally removed it, the elements committee, and I finally removed it from the service. And that, we lost two-thirds of the congregation at that point. And a lot of that, I mean, they, a lot of them were believe, believed as we believed, like they were not theistic believers. They did not believe in a supernatural God. They thought the Bible was a human construction. They didn't believe there was a virgin birth and a star and a bunch of magi. Like, you know, they didn't believe any of those stories, but they wanted their church to look like traditional church and sound like traditional church. So it gave them comfort. It made them happy. It was part of their religious tradition. That's right. So they left and went to another congregation and, uh, and immediately began transforming that congregation because they had five or six years of very non-exclusive theological language. So although the format of that service is still, of their service is now very similar to ours, the language, a lot of the language is still retained, even though there's no more belief in it by them than there was when they were at West Hill. Anyway, so West Hill was then in a financial crisis and our numbers had dropped substantially. But You know, seven years later, we have maybe not as many people in the pews as before that, but we have close. And we've started another satellite community on the other side of the city. And uh, our financial health is not, um, you know, like it's like most suburban congregations. Actually, it's better than most suburban congregations. Eight congregations in my denomination have closed around us in the last 10 years, 15 years. So, you know, there's a lot of a lot of press about, you know, I lost two thirds of my congregation. Yeah, I did. But they had a place to go. They had there are dozens of congregations around us, any one of which would have offered them what they were looking for. But we now have a congregation that is made up of people who would have nowhere else to go if we weren't doing what we were doing. So we have brought people into the United Church of Canada. We brought people into our congregation who wouldn't otherwise be engaged in this kind of community at all. What's the narrative there that you drove them out? This was the last straw. Is that how it's oh, been yeah, framed or what? Of, yeah, that's pretty much how it's been put. Well, so. look, I'm on staffs of some higher office in the Methodist Church. And one of our reverend ministers, whatever, is not a believer in God and is essentially preaching humanism, cherry picking from the Bible, some happier stories and probably ignoring most of the carnage. (laughs) Or are you using some of the more bloody verses of scripture to make a moral point in some way? Who knows how you're using it, but you're not a literalist. You're not a fundamentalist. You don't even buy it. But yet you are a minister in my church. And I'm thinking, what are we paying you for? Why don't we have somebody who is a quote-unquote Methodist in our Methodist church? That is not a surprising reaction. Is that essentially what has happened to you? Uh, Just to clarify, Methodists are one of three denominations that came into the United Church of Canada in 1925. So I consider myself a United Church of Canada minister. But I'm a United Church of Canada person. I was born and raised in the United Church of Canada. I 
I was taught a very progressive theology. Well, uh, let me stop you there. Let me stop you for just a second and define the United Church of Canada is what? What do they believe? What do they not believe? How do you frame the United Church of Canada for our listeners? The United Church of Canada is probably the most progressive denomination on the planet within the Christian church. It was founded in 1925 after a couple of decades of conversations amongst the Methodists, the Congregationalists, and about half the Presbyterians who joined at that time. Clergy coming into union were concerned about having to ascribe to a cobbled together statement of doctrine. And so in order to allow them to continue to preach according to the tradition that they'd been ordained in, they were given what was called essential agreement. So they only had to ever be in essential agreement with the Articles of Faith. Since then, that essential agreement clause has been used across the country in United Church congregations to allow a very broad interpretation of our statements of doctrine. So when someone is being ordained, a committee has to discern and decide that the person being ordained is in essential agreement. So, and this is, I'm giving you sort of a ridiculous interpretation, but say someone came to a committee and said, I think that uh, the warm feeling I get when I'm playing with my kittens and my puppy dog, that that feeling is indication that there is a more supernatural uh, something happening or it just feels good and that makes me feel like I'm, you know, honoring what God wants me to do. Now, that's a completely ridiculous picture and I'm being, I'm exaggerating on purpose. But the committee could say, could discuss it amongst themselves and decide, you know, we think that that's a valid interpretation and we would like this person to be able to go forward into ministry. They then say to the person, you can now be ordained, which means when you get to that ceremony and you are asked the question, do you believe in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? You can say yes to that question because that committee has decided that whatever you believe, it is in essential agreement with that statement. So we have a diversity of belief in the United Church of Canada that goes from the literal interpretation of that Trinitarian formula to very, very progressive understandings. Doesn't this feel like a tap dance to you? Do you believe in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and you don't, but you can still say yes because you are in quote-unquote essential agreement, which sounds like a hugely nebulous umbrella turn that could cover about anything. Yes, and and essential agreement has covered a lot over the course of our denomination's history. So when I was at theological college and given the tools of critical inquiry to address all of those things, when I got to my committee's conversation, whatever it was I said at that point in time was seen to be in essential agreement, and I was given permission to answer those questions affirmatively. I'm now under review in the United Church, uh, from the United Church, because they are now asking that I be in continuing affirmation of those questions without being able to be tested for essential agreement. So now, for the first time in United Church history, a clergy person is being asked to answer those questions literally. They're trying to force you out. Well, yeah, either that or they're trying to say, I mean, I can't imagine that that's not what they're trying to do, although they... Well, knowing you're an atheist, even if you go out and you say, okay, I agree with a literal trinity, they're going to know that you're just keeping your job, right? That's true, and I wouldn't do that. But the problem is that many of my clergy colleagues would argue that they do not believe in a supernatural interventionist theistic being, which makes them technically atheist. Now, would they argue this publicly or just privately to you? Well, someone sent me an article of a retired United Church clergy person who was charged by a black bear and whistled in order to scare the bear away, which he was able to do. And at the end of that, he said something like, uh, you know, I don't believe in miracles and I don't believe God intervenes in anything. So I don't think God had anything to do with this. But I did get some nice, you know, samples of rock that he had been looking for. So 
he said in that article that he didn't believe in a supernatural interventionist God. So people will say it. Uh, Wait a minute. I'm, I'm confused. Forgive me. Greta. Sorry. That Did he say he thanked God, but he didn't no, believe he didn't. it was a supernatural God? Or no, what was his overall point? No, he, I think he was asked the question, do you think God saved you? And he was oh, saying, I no, I don't think God does that kind of thing. That's not what my understanding of God is. So, Thank you. you know, so there's, there's those understandings out there. My colleagues often ask me to come into an empty room with them if we're at a meeting. And in the empty room, they'll say, you know, I really support what you're doing. Uh, you know, it's really great. We really need to go in this direction. And, and then they'll, you know, leave the room and pretend they never had the conversation. So I know and what people use to hide behind is the very condescending, uh, you know, Greta, I probably don't believe in the God you don't believe in either. Well, if you don't, why don't you stop using a word that describes the God I don't believe in more effectively than anything else? So if you don't believe in that God, are you willing to answer this question? When I use the word God, I mean dot, dot, dot. What does the end of that sentence, how do you fill that in? And many of them would not fill it in with anything that included supernatural or theistic. Do you think that some of this is, hey, I'm kind of long in the tooth. This is the only thing I've ever known, the only thing I've ever done. If I was to lose this gig, I would be totally hosed. I have a family and a mortgage and kids in college and whatnot. It's just easier for me to project the supernatural deity and hang on to the pulpit, at least for now. Is there some of that going on, you think? I do think that there is some of that going on. I'm a director for the clergy project, and I knew that I do know that clergy who no longer believe are off, often find themselves in economic situations where they cannot make a change. It has to feel and like a prison in some way. You're, it does. It's you're very, denying very yourself. It's very, very hard. And I, I know that some clergy have said to me, I don't know what I would do if I wasn't preaching the Bible. Like, what on earth would I talk about? Well, I mean, I've talked about stuff other than the Bible for 14 or 15 years now, and I haven't run out of topics yet. And I don't use, we don't read from the Bible in my services. Um, we read contemporary, we read from anything that we think is worthy to be brought into the space. So, well, I'm going to hang out here for just a second because that interests me. So, you may draw a story from the Bible, but you do it generally without actually holding a Bible in your hand and reading specific scriptures. And you often bring other texts to the pulpit and teach from them? No. We don't use the Bible at all. You don't use it at all? No. For a long period of time, I read a Bible passage and an alternative reading. Um, now, what does that mean? Well, just I would read a Bible passage that was from the lectionary, and then I would read a passage, a poem, or something from Charles Dickens, or you know, something that I read in the newspaper, or something that, was, that I think has the opportunity, has the power to engage people, challenge them a little bit, edify them maybe. And so I choose the readings that come on. So this week, it's a couple of readings by Jean Beignet that have to do with hospitality. So I've chosen them and those are the ones that are being read. But I've read anything. I've, I've read across the spectrum. I've read stuff from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I mean, I've read all kinds of stuff in the service. I read... Uh, Love's the only rule, the, the text of that a couple of weeks ago. I'm one of the heads of this tribunal or whatever that's going to bring you in in chains, and they're all going to stand there with scepters and, <laughs> and yeah. pass judgment upon the, you know, if I can be melodramatic. Yeah. And someone tells them, you realize that she has used Buffy the Vampire Slayer in one of her sermons. <laughs> I mean, those of us watching this from the outside can see why they've got their underwear in a snit over this this whole thing. But then after I say that, I become conflicted because if you believe in essential agreement, I'm not sure what the mold looks like or is it always changing? It's confusing and hard for us to understand from the outside in. And that's very perceptive. That's exactly the issue. My denomination over the course of my entire life has always been about dialogue, about, I mean, it was birthed in dialogue. It's been about bringing to the table the voices that are going to condemn it and challenge it to be transformed to a new understanding. We ordained women that way in 1936. We 
allowed divorced clergy to remain in the public. We wrestled with the idea of women uh, having control over their own bodies around abortion issues in the late 60s. We talked about, uh, we started talking about human sexuality in the 1970s and in 1988 decided that sexuality should not be a barrier to participation in the leadership of the church. We uh, have have made political statements. We have made statements about the environment. We have constantly drawn up to the table the voices of those who have been disenfranchised, who have been rejected because of religious beliefs, who have had scriptural passages drawn uh, in the sand between them and participation, and we have risked that conversation. In this conversation, we have not had a conversation at all. It has been completely refused. So while I've grown up in a church that has taught me to bring the value of growth and wisdom and radical inclusivity to the point of non-exclusivity, this denomination I see as a denomination that lives by its values, not by the doctrinal beliefs that it holds. But this conversation is about doctrinal belief, Uh, and it's the first time that I'm aware of that that conversation has taken place within my denomination. This is sort of your own Protestant Reformation. Rather than jump out into another church building or call yourself a humanist chaplain or come up with another moniker or banner or frame in which to have this conversation, you're doing it from within in an attempt to bring it into the 21st century. Would that be an accurate way of saying it? Yes, and to invite it to step into the space that I believe it's called to by its values, um, to step into that place where it can continue to serve the human community and life on the planet by advancing and offering a set of humanitarian values that are more important than the doctrinal beliefs that it posts on its website. Be easier, Um, though, if they just scratched the word church out of the whole thing and just said humanism or community in some way, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, it would. And that would be fine with me. I mean, I, I think that would be great. I mean, I stay in the church. I've fought for the church for these many years because I believe the United Church is the only denomination on the planet that is ready to take that step and that if it does not take that step, it convicts itself of acting against what it has been teaching and modeling for its 90-year history. What I hear, it sounds like the kind of place I wouldn't mind checking out myself. You know, you're inclusive, you're about people, you walked away from the woo, you want to be about good ideas. Let's get back to the potential expulsion that you're facing from the church. Kind of flesh that out for me. Is is there a date set? Are you supposed to appear before a group? Are they going to rule in your absence? How's it going to play out? There was no way for them to review me. Uh, you can only be reviewed in for two things in the United Church of Canada. One is for your effectiveness as a minister, and one is if you don't submit to the authority of your jurisdictional body. And they agreed that they couldn't review me on either of those charges. So they asked the highest executive staff person in the denomination to create a way to review me. And, you know, I've been incredulous through this whole thing, which perhaps I'm really naive, but I didn't think that she would do that because we are a denomination that values diversity of belief over doctrinal adherence. And so I thought that she would say, wait, this is the United Church of Canada. We don't do that kind of thing. But she didn't. Uh, instead, she reinterpreted effectiveness to include suitability and suitability to include the ongoing affirmation of your ordination vows. Now, the group that asked her for that ruling specifically said they specifically removed the essential agreement piece so that there couldn't be any movement around those vows. And she laid that down in her ruling, saying you have to be in continuing affirmation of those vows. And uh, set, she identified an existing group in the denomination to be uh, my review panel, and that's the interview board. I have been told through the media, I didn't learn this from someone in the church, that that will be whittled down to five people. 
and that those five people will, will report to the 40 people who will report to the conference executive who will determine whether or not I need a formal review, which it, starts the whole process again. It's like and a star chamber, the, you know? It it's, is. It, and it's been called that by many people. It takes place in a closed room. There's no one there but those five people. I have no opportunity to determine whether those five people are biased for or against me. I don't even know who they are. Now, we have put it all on hold by appealing it. And so we have to file our appeal documents and go through it. And you'll find this interesting. I'm sure one of the, one of the people who was part of the initiation of this process congratulated me and said how happy he was to know that I had a, an excellent lawyer uh, whose work he was familiar with. And I said, so why, why is that? And he said, because we'll get a very good review process out of it, which means that if I, I mean, I don't know what it means, but if I had a bad lawyer, if they would have just, you know, let me sink like a stone. Um, but it means that we're going to go through this incredible legal process, perhaps to create a review process that will then be used against my colleagues. And that's troubling. And I'm not I haven't decided what to do about that at this point. Yeah, the word precedent comes to mind. Yeah, yeah. The world so, watches you because what happens with you may affect the DNA of the quote-unquote Methodists or the United Church of Canada and or whoever moving forward. Well, the United Church of Canada has just actually entered into a full communion agreement with the United Church of Christ in the States. So I would be very interested to learn if the United Church of Christ would think that a trial such as this, a hearing such as, as this, is something that they would do. Um, well, in my opinion, in my perspective, the United Church, if anything, quite often are not all that united. <laughs> you yes, know, you know, that's churches true. Churches are, we're ex when I was in the church, they were experts at splitting. I mean, they, they found moments of disagreement over the most minor, the most shallow of things. The color of the hymnals could split yes, a church, yes. those well, types and, of and things. And in, in Australia, they were, they were wise enough to call it the Uniting Church. So that there's not like this it's something to, to aspire to. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's an article in the Vancouver Sun dated January 20th of this year that says, will Greta Vosper do the honorable thing? I'm guessing walk away. Mm -hmm. Yes. So come on. Why don't you walk? Why don't you skip all of this nonsense and all the legal hassles and the expense and the bad press? Why don't you just skip it and go do your own thing elsewhere? Well, part of the reason is that I serve a community and the people in that community believe that they are also on trial here, that the United Church is also deciding whether or not they belong. Now, there are fewer people in the congregation now who actually have a United Church background than there were before because we've brought people from other faith traditions and from no faith tradition at all into community, but their future is very much bound up with mine at this point in time. And so I am in conversation with them about how to move forward. What's the temperature of the congregation? Are they nervous? Are they sitting on their hands? Do they have their fist in the air saying, yeah, go get them, Greta. We got your back. Big pep rally. I mean, what's the vibe? They're very angry and they're very confused because they don't understand how something like this could come about without any official from the church ever coming to see what we do when we gather, ever asking our board or our congregation into uh, asking us to come into dialogue. No one has ha sat down with me to have a conversation. There has been no dialogue whatsoever, so they don't understand why now, after 15 years of transition, uh, 11 years of being totally out as not believing in a divine interventionist supernatural being, um, that, the, that the denomination is coming down on us now. Like, they don't understand that, and they're not happy. I mean, I can see the comment section already. I mean, there are some who hear the idea of fixing the ship from within. You're inside the craft. You're going to shore it up. You're going to renovate it. You're going to make it seaworthy from inside the craft. And other people say, why would you bother? Scuttle the old ship and board this new ship, which is based in science, reason, the evidence, common sense. 
why would you ever even want to attach yourself to these ancient ideas? They are often wrong-headed ancient ideas. And I can honestly see both. Part of me admires you, Greta, for trying to promote rationality and humanistic ideas and helping our fellow man and woman and and making the world a better place and embracing reason over woo and doing it inside a church. Part of me thinks that's just awesome. It's delightful. If you tried it in my hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma, they'd be circling the building with torches. <laughs> you know, they just freak out. And a part of me is like, yeah, I mean, that's amazing. And the other half is like, it's church, you know, bust out of there, break free, go breathe the free air and create a platform that from the beginning is based on science, reason and the evident. Does that sort of conflict of um, perception, I mean, do you go through that in your own mind? About three o'clock in the morning every night. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously. Um, part. I think I have been so uh, so tied to a vision of the United Church of Canada having a conversation within it that invites its members to leave go of those aspects of church and religion that have been so problematic in society that are so exclusive, even, even when we think that we have got this cool, you know, liberal, progressive perspective, to let go of that, condemn its use anywhere else, and carry forward within community those values that are negotiated and renegotiated by community to hold it to a moral standard. Now, help I, me I, understand you, Greta, because I'm, I'm not grasping when you, are you speaking ill of liberal progressive values? No, I think many of those liberal progressive values are are worthy, um, but I I don't think that we should we should uh, take them in archaic language and theology, particularly language and theology that the United Church of Canada has been teaching its seminarians for half a century is not factual, but is metaphorical. Or if it is factual, it was written at a time when the worldview was so different from what ours is now that it has no merit in that conversation. And the United Church of Canada has been teaching that for decades, but it does not support its clergy when they try to take that conversation into the pulpit, into the congregation. And I think that that conversation is a vibrant and important conversation. If the United Church of Canada entered into that conversation, it would demand by its very actions that every other liberal mainline Protestant denomination have the conversation too, in the same way that our, you know, refusing to deny leadership to the LGBTQ community has rippled through other Christian denominations, mainline denominations. And now, uh, through Tony Campolo's conversation about same-sex marriage, is now rippling into evangelical Christianity, uh, though that, that is not, you know, dramatically apparent yet. Reverend Greta Vosper, I'm going to use the word reverend because I just see it printed everywhere. Is gretavosper.ca the best place for people to sort of follow your journey as it unfolds? Yes, absolutely. I'd also say my congregation, which is westhill.net. Westhill.net. Well, thanks for sharing your story and your perspective. It's something that uh, I was eager to sort of get into. And, you know, I, I myself still in a way feel foreign to the idea of an atheist seeking to be in any context of a quote-unquote religious institution. But in another way, I do understand what you're doing and what you're about. And I find it refreshing to hear someone speak so frankly about the nature of being in the pulpit. I also want to take a second to draw a circle around something that I try to do whenever we're talking about quote-unquote ministers in churches. It's easy for those on the outside to caricaturize those who are believers. Oh, they just want the money. They're just passing the plate. It's a big scam. They're all getting rich, blah, blah, blah. And Greta can speak probably better than most to the fact that most people who are in positions of ministry, pastoral or otherwise, are not there because they're making the coin. 
they're there because they genuinely believe in what they're about, often making a modest living and trying in their way to make a difference. Would that be an accurate way to phrase that? Absolutely. My congregation pays my salary. It's not paid by the national church. It's, uh, you know, I make probably the same amount of money that a first year teacher makes. So, you know, accusations that I'm in it for the money are ludicrous. And this process is a, is a massively expensive legal process. So, you know, that's a, that's a challenge. Greta, thanks for sharing your story on the radio. Thanks for being a part of the broadcast. And I'll make a bookmark here and just check in occasionally to see how things are going up there. Now, is there any date set for anything or is it all just sort of up in the air? The only date we have right now is uh, September 18th is when we have to file our appeal documents. Okay. That's this could probably date. drag on for a while. Then, it huh? could take quite some time to get through this process. Litigation. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the word just gives fear and loathing and dread mm -hmm. to so many. Greta, thanks for being a great guest on the radio. Thanks for your time and uh, all my best up there in Canada. Okay. I so appreciate the conversation, Seth. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the broadcast. I'll see you back here Thursday as we do another show in just a couple of days. Huge thanks out to Nature Box for supporting the broadcast. You get so much good taste without all the junk, and your first box is on them. So check it out, naturebox.com slash thinkingatheist. And I'll see you Thursday. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. Thethinkingatheist.com.